Greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is such a joy to be here in the presence of God and especially in front of you with the Word of God. Uh, as we know, we have been covering the series uh, uh, New, and the Living, New and Living Way. Um, and um, as we have been breaking through each of these topics uh, from the new covenant to the new birth to the new fruit, uh, new family, uh, and now we um, are in the new purpose. Um, and so where we're going to turn to this morning is in Isaiah 61 verses 3. Isaiah 61 verses 3. That they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Let me read that again. That we may be, that they may be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Let us pray for a moment. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace. We pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to see this vision, O oh Lord, of us among the remnant, among the the crowds of people as one of the oaks, O oh Lord, Lord, being planted by the Lord full of righteousness, living for your glory forever and ever, Lord. And I pray that the word that, we, uh, that I have given me today will bring about fruit, O oh Lord God, in each one of our hearts, O oh Lord. Oh, let only what you have in store for this congregation come forth, O oh Lord. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Without any f further introduction, let me go right into the word. Um, in, in this particular passage, we see three aspects. Uh, and in the next slide, uh, you will see uh, in a pictorial sense what they are. The first is that uh, we are the oaks of righteousness. We are the oaks of righteousness. And second, that we are the planting of the Lord and all these things is so that he may be glorified. Hallelujah. So I'm going to go backwards in my order and uh, just break down each of these three things and then I will be seated. First, we are, we, we are uh, made for his glory. We exist for the glory of God. I think most of us know this, at least in theory, that we are redeemed for his glory. That, and and we, may, we may say at time to time when people praise us or things good happen to us, we may say, you know, glory to God, or we may say for God's glory, and then we proceed to talk about something good that happened to us. Um, but what is the glory of God? What is the glory of God? Glory of God is the sum total of all his attributes. I mean, that's the simplest way that we can put it. His create, from his creative acts in making the world and all the living beings in the world from the beginning of time until now, all of these things display his glory. The beautiful, the, the galaxies that now we are able to see with the new telescopes, the, the creation of the world, the great, uh, the great canyon and the mountains and the valleys and the, and the oceans of the world. All these were created by him so that no one is without excuse. No one can say there is no God. And most of all, his act of redemption in saving us also displays his glory. In scripture, God is generally called the God of glory. He's called the King of glory. God the Father uh, is called the Father of glory, the Father of lights. Jesus is called the Lord of glory, the glorious Lord. And the Spirit of God is called the Spirit of glory. And when scripture tries to uh, describe events about God, where God's glory was revealed, especially when he reveals himself to human beings, often his glory is described as light, a bright light. And do you know that this light that we describe is actually a combination of different wavelengths? Like, you know, we see this most uh, vividly, especially when there is a rainbow in the sky. I mean, we, uh, those of us who learned this in school know that when the sun rays hit the water droplets in the sky, it, there's a refraction and reflection, and out from that comes this, this varied colored rainbow, right? Vibgior, we say as a, as a short to list out all the colors in that rainbow. So the light that we say, this bright light, in, when you break it down, it, it's a multicolored facet. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quantity of multicolors. In the same way, 
that through the word and through the spirit of God, God reveals his multi-dimensional glory to us. When we talk about the glory of God, that alone can be seen as a theory or, or something that we cannot grasp, but God in his kindness revealed his glory to us in human flesh through the person of Jesus Christ. And so through Jesus, we're able to see all aspects of the glory of God from a human being standpoint. And so we should ought to be in our heart thankful that God revealed himself not only through creation, not only through the living beings and the beautiful things that we see around us, but in a human sense, he was able to reveal himself in a step down, you know, we know talk about step down transformers, some high voltage or low voltage. Same way he stepped down his glory so that we will not die seeing his full glory, but in a human sense, we can see his glory and his fullness through the person of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And here's the tough part of his glory. God doesn't share his glory to anyone else. Isaiah 42, 8 says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. 1 Corinthians 1, 28 to 29 says, God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. So we have to be careful when we take glory from God or when we boast about ourselves as if we are a self-made person. And I'm not talking about this irrational fear of God that we have to walk on eggshells or anything like that. What I'm saying is that at the basic level, we need to understand what our true state is, where we came from, who we are, who we were, and in that, that is the basis of which and when God has transformed us and brought us out of the darkness into the realm of the light, out of, from enemies to friends, we cannot in good faith steal the glory from God because we were dead and now we are alive. Who else can make things alive? Who else can make dead things alive? No one can. No doctor in this world can bring life into a dead body. But God can bring life into dead people and so as, as people of God made alive in Christ we need to be careful when we steal glory from God just in a very practical sense taking glory from God is like plagiarizing plagiarizing is a very common thing that we are aware of especially colleges and schools makes it very aware of this nowadays uh, you know, they make sure you take a course or take a class and you sign off saying, I understand what plagiarism is. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to make an excuse that I didn't know about this. You know, that, all that is covered in colleges these days. Stealing glory from God is like plagiarizing. Like copying, uh, what is plagiarizing? Copying other people's ideas and words and making it our, our own. A long time ago, that was possible in the start of the internet. I remember uh, it just... It's so the internet was just starting, and so you had a few websites you can go. You would make it would be so obvious in the way that people would plagiarize sometimes. Uh, and, and nowadays things have gotten a lot more trickier and smarter. But even then, as as plagiarism is getting smarter, there are also detection uh, software that is also getting smarter as well. So I, I'm just giving you this is free advice. Please do not plagiarize and get in trouble. So what is much more fearful than, say, in an academic setting, if you plagiarize, you might get an F for the course, or you might get kicked out, or you might go into academic discipline. There are a whole host of things that schools do to ensure that you are punished. But how much more fearful it is to be in front of the judgment seat of Christ when he runs a scan and detects where have we stolen his glory in, in claiming things for ourselves and boasting things that are clearly his, the gifts that he has given us, the the, the talents that he has given us, the opportunities in which he has opened doors for us. But, you know, at the same time, God is so merciful that in this life itself, he helps us run some scans to see where we have fallen. And, and, and by the word and through the spirit, he disciplines us, even in this life, so that we will repent, we will turn away, and we will walk forward. This moment here, just to talk from his word, is another opportunity for us to scan once again in our heart. Like, where have I stolen this glory from God? 
And let me just also, another warning. <laughs> what, what happens when we fail to give God the glory? A couple of passages here. Acts 12, 23. Uh, we may have discussed this before in our series on the book of Acts. Um, Herod, who killed the, uh, James, the apostle, it says that because Herod, in later on in his life, because Herod did not give glory to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he, has e- he was eaten by worms and died. Romans 1, 21, 25. We know this as well. For they, although they knew God, they did, not, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring, dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. What an indictment that God gave them up. That long, you can go long enough in life where God in His patience waits and waits and waits and gives you chances uh, either through the, the Word of God, through, through the community, and then God can at some point just give us up to what we want to do, which is following the lust of our hearts, following the the desire of our hearts to the chase after things that are not of God. When Jesus was on earth, many, that, many believed in Jesus but did not want to go to take the next step because they loved the glory that came from man. And we can see this in John chapter 12, 37 and, and some verses after that. It says here that though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. And going on to verse 42... Many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Think about here the, the things that they're considering. You know, they, they, they saw the signs. They saw the wonders. They, they could believe but they chose not to, out of the fear that they, they're, they're going to lose the, the glory that they have from man. The, 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 the glory that, that, these, that the community was giving them. There are many people that are stuck in that. that they're, they're afraid of the, 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 the status, that, that losing the status in life. They're afraid of losing uh, what they have. They love it. And we have to ask ourselves this as well. Let's not become self-righteous in this. There are many areas in our life where we love so much that we're not willing to let go for instead the glory of God. When we start loving things that are, that are from man, it is a warning that our heart is calloused, that we have a hard heart, that, that we cannot... When we don't hear the things of God, when pre- the word is being preached over and over again, and we, yet, we cannot yet surrender to the voice of God, that is a sign that we are falling away from the Lord. And this is again a moment for us to, to wake up, to be awake in the Lord by the power of the Spirit, and to hear the voice of the Lord, and to give glory to God, to confess our sins, as the word says. Confess our sins and give glory to God. So in our lives, what are we... What are we asked to do as people of God? 1 Corinthians 10, 31, we know this verse as well. Whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. This covers everything, really, because our basic sustenance is if we cannot eat or drink, we can get away with a lot of things, but we can, if we cannot eat or drink, that it's very difficult. I know, and for me, it is very difficult, at least. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, it all to the glory of God. Whatever you touch, whatever you see, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Amen. And this is in context also of, of disagreements in the church. And, and this is how I see it. You know, when disagreements come in the church, my posture is to give it up. Give up the area of, of, of contention out of love for my brother or sister. Because I want to give glory to God. Because the way of showing glory to God 
is coming in unity in one mind and one heart with that brother or sister in disagreement with me. That's my end goal is to give glory to God. I don't want any of the glory. I don't want to push my, my, uh, my uh, you know, attitude and, uh, or, or my convictions in a way that, 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 that becomes a stumbling block. But I, instead, I will die to my, my particular views so that I can bring glory to God with that brother or sister together. Hallelujah. And any, any standard short of this, right, is, is sin. We know this verse too, Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is a violation of God's glory. Sin is a cheap and a fake alternative to the glory of God. Sin is empty and hollow while the glory of God is weighty and full. Sin can, can appear shiny for a moment, but it's actually a very thin veneer the last maybe for a short bit of time. But God's glory is, is vastly, vastly, infinitely different. And a child of God ought to know the difference. God's glory is beautiful. God's glory is eternal. God's glory is full of His wonderful attributes like love, joy, peace, and so on. And we ought to discern as children of God, we ought to discern the difference between the glory of God and, and the glory of man or, the, or, or any kind of fake alternative. I should be able to detect that what, am I, what I'm getting myself into is not from the Lord. What, am I getting, what I'm getting about to get myself into is not of the will of God. What I'm about to get myself into, in, into falls short of this glorious purpose that God has for my life. So we exist for God's glory. Second truth that we see in this verse is that we are a planting of the Lord. Now we all enjoy the, the story of a self-made person. You know, the person that beats all the odds, comes out of poverty or challenges in life, and they work really hard, they study really hard, they, you know, they, they work, uh, they, they go under a street lamp, you know, uh, we hear the stories from our parents sometimes. Uh, and, and they make a lot of success by sheer will and determination. But as a child of God, that dimension ought to, ought to be different. We ought to know more than others that how many small things had to work together in our favor for each of the blessings that we have. That, you know, we tend to forget and steal credit, but it is an undeniable fact that if it wasn't for the Lord weaving together events dating back centuries, even before our birth, dating, uh, weaving together people from various upbringings and backgrounds, just looking at this church alone, the church body here comes from various different parts of the wor world, not just Kara alone, but even from the world. And weaving together resources and skills and different levels of talent, from various people, like everything that is here, we should never steal the glory of the Lord. That everything that we have here is from God. And, and, and one thing we have to understand is that not even 1% of what we have here is not, we cannot have even 1%, do 1% of what we do here without the Lord. So we are a planting of the Lord, which indicates a, a level of belonging, that God owns us, that we are the planting of the Lord. We didn't plant ourselves. And, and the truth of this truth is so comforting also because it, it takes a lot of burden off our back, you know. Why, why are we often overstressed and overburdened? Because we think we're on our own, that we are all, everything is determined on me. Like, I have to do this. I have to be a better person. I have to uh, uh, work really hard. I, it's all me. It's all me. And we're, you're working based on other people's expectations. As, a, uh, as an Indian community, this is big for us, that we are, we are often working for others' expectations. They have very high expectations because they were not able to achieve, achieve those same things, but they want to dream through us. And sometimes we work for others' expectations. And sometimes we make even unhealthy decisions because we're trying to please others more than we please the Lord. But if, if you and I were to meditate on the fact that we are a planting of the Lord, that if God has planted me somewhere, there's a purpose behind that. If, if, you know, I'm, I'm going to be satisfied in Jesus 
Because he has a sovereign purpose for me in where I am today. Until he says go, I won't go. Until he says join, I won't join. Until he says move, I won't move. Until he says I am ready, I'm not ready. Because I am a planting of the Lord. I belong to God. I belong to God. And lastly, we are oaks of righteousness. We're called oaks of righteousness. And oaks are marvelous trees. That What you see there is a glimpse of an oak tree. They're large and mighty. They, they last a long time. These, these trees last hundreds of years and even thousands of years. There's some actually some trees that have lasted thousands of years. And they can withstand storms and every kind of climatic events. And mainly it's because they're so deeply rooted. As much as you see up top, you see a, a complex root system down below. And, and so, and another thing you can say, um, like the age of the oak. The age of the oak, you can say, you can measure it by its size. You know, if you measure its diameter and divide it by the normal rate of growth, it gives you a sense of how old the, the age of the tree is. And, and also the oak tree uh, doesn't produce its own fruit. And the fruit of the oak tree is typically an acorn. It has some nuts in it. Uh, it but it, some of them, it takes about 20 years to the fruit, and, and, and in most cases, actually 50 or 70 years later that these trees produce fruit. And so we're not only oaks, we're, we're called oaks of righteousness. So when we, you know, when we start thinking in terms of what we can do for the Lord and taking action steps, we need to consider whether we are these oaks growing in righteousness. One thing to remind ourselves is that we cannot become a large oak tree overnight. And that's why I measure, they talked about the measurement and the, and the bearing the fruit and all that. And it's not also by just living life, coasting through life. Active time with the Lord, it needs to be given for growth and maturity. Like active time. And so we have to appreciate you know, the, the, the growing pains. God has ordained a time and a season for everyone. That delays and waits in life are, are a part of this preparation process. And, and we need to grow in His peace. And it's with His timing. And I'd rather be this, this, this tree of righteousness first before anything else. I'm reminded of Jesus saying to uh, the people. that says, many will come saying, Lord, Lord. Did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not do mighty works? And Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So our growth in righteousness matters. That I'd rather be an oak of righteousness rather than a mighty man of God, known as a mighty man of God, doing works of iniquity in private. Let us uh, pray for a moment. Hallelujah. I want to bring us to the vision of Christ this morning. We talked about different things here. Jesus stepped down from glory so that we may be glorified, that we may bring glory to God. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness so that we can be declared righteous. Jesus gave his life so that we can be this mighty oak, a living oak that is planted and owned by him. So like that picture that we see, it's not just us alone we're not just one lonely oak in, 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 a, in a valley, but God is preparing a remnant. That's why he says, they will be called oaks of righteousness. Amen. It's not just us. There will be a community of people together that God is preparing. There's many people in this city, as, as the Holy Spirit said, or as Jesus said. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this morning. We thank you that you are in control, O oh Lord. We thank you, Jesus that we can rest in you, that we can set our eyes on you, that we can trust you, O Lord, to carry us through the end of time, O Lord God, that one day we'll, be, we'll have this glorious vision of being grown and matured in righteousness, seeing you face to face, giving you all the glory through our life, with our words, with our actions, Lord. Help us to be a pleasing sacrifice, holy and righteous in your sight. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.